welcome everyone and uh, thanks for coming along to our lecture tonight. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Xavier Walker, who's one of the physicians, uh, geriatrician in this hospital, uh, among other um, jobs that he has. And he's going to talk on And uh, Xavier's going to talk about Dr. Tom Doctor to the Pacific. So welcome, Xavier. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. uh, Kirana, um, warm Pacific greetings and good to see you. I might just um, and start us with prayer. Um, so I'd just uh, like to invite uh, one of our uh, Cook Island leaders, uh, Mama Kenny. Would, would you be able to lead us in prayer if that, that's okay? Let us pray. Tomato mitsua tapu e Jehovah, irungaitera ni teite. Koe te ki te aro ai te takunga mita ki e mātou. Iro toe te atsua i te atsianga nei te aga mita ki nei mātou i te atsikaanga mānea, ko arave i mātou i te atsua rutu i te ingutu are. Te aga mita ki e te atsua i Dr. Saivia Walker. No te pati mai e te atsua i te te atsua hatau. Tāna api e te atsua, tāna kōrero e te atsua norungai. The late Papa Sir Tom Davis, the Patsuo de Rangerik. So, Matu Mitsua Tapue, a Mamane Tea, a Karongo Matu, it is two, it is two, or Tea Mitsua Tane, Tona Kitapakari, Tona Mara, my Tetsua, Iroto Tea, Tianga Nate, Pupu, Tuneo Tea, Mara Varai, Rotuito Orimaro, now it's a key, a paru, Yamato, Katotoa, Kiroto, Yesu, Tomato, Atsu Tomato, Akaura. Amen. Okay. Kentucky. Does everybody hear us online okay? Hopefully um, everybody's good online. Everybody can hear me up in the back. Um, so again, my name is Xavier Walker. Um, one of the geriatricians and associate dean uh, Pacific for the division. Um, very honoured to, to talk about uh, a role model and a, an extraordinary uh, human being, um, uh, Papa uh, Tom Davis, and uh, just acknowledge the Cook Island community. Um, just wanted to acknowledge um, quite a few people, uh, the Sir Thomas uh, Davis family. Uh, we have uh, reached out actually a little late, but uh, with, with, through Kiki. Um, uh, just acknowledge the uh, space we're entering. It's, this is this is a uh, extraordinary and not only alumni but also one of uh, uh, the great sons of the Cook Islands. So I, I hope I do you justice tonight, and uh, I'll do my very best. Um, but I just acknowledge the space we're entering tonight. Uh, Mr. Kiki Moate, who's the son of Te Rewhiti Moate, the former Prime Minister, is also our Associate Dean Pacific for Christchurch and President of the Pacifica Medical Association. Unfortunately, he sends apologies to be in person, but he's looking to be us on, online uh, tonight, and I'll just uh, thank you for his guidance. Uh, Mama Kenny, uh, thank you for your, your leadership and with the Cook Island community. Uh, we've also invited the Cook Island community, so there may be people also online. Um, uh, Brigadier Dr. Brian McMahon, uh, who's been a mentor to, to me for many years. He's actually a, a contemporary of uh, uh, Papa Tom. Um, they, he's class of 1954. Uh, Papa Tom is class of 54, but they all knew each other. And, uh, and uh, uh, Sir Tom was quite well known in, in Otago, so he gave me a lot of anecdotes and stories and helped me with some piecing together around the wartime years, what was happening. Uh, just to acknowledge the Otago Medical Alumni, thanks Professor Doyle for uh, the opportunity to talk about, talk about uh, uh, this uh, uh, great in individual. Uh, the Hocken Library, come in, just a uh, piece of coming uh, for the research. And just thank you everybody for uh, coming in and on a uh, not so tropical uh, Dunedin night uh, to come and share this. Uh, there's a lot of information when you're going through someone's history of, of this amount. Um, you know, we can't cover it all. Um, I've focused a lot on the formative years of his early upbringing in the, in the Cooks uh, University and early life. Uh, 
I've touched on some of the later part, but um, really of the why of, of, of how things happened and, and, and things. So um, a lot of the books I'll, I'll talk about. This is a, a bit of a love affair of about 15, 20 years I've had uh, researching uh, Papa Tom. So uh, finding Papa Tom. First time, who's heard of uh, Sir Tom Davis? So just a little raise of hands. And who's it? Someone there? Okay, so about half the audience. Um, first time I ever heard of Topper Palm, Tom or meeting him was at a Pacific Medical Association. The murmurs went around and probably was about 2003, 2004. It was a murmur that, you know, Papa Tom, Papa Tom, Papa Tom's in the audience. And the whole room of, a, you know, hundreds of people just shushed. And the manner of this person walking in, and I was like, who is this person? It's just, you don't often have that. And I've been intrigued ever since. So in 2006, we organized the National Leadership Conference in Wellington for the medical students. Uh, this is outside Turnbull House. And I've, we were determined to, to find Papa Tom. And he was in Australia. Uh, Kiki Moate kindly uh, was able to get hold of uh, Lady Carla, uh, Sir Tom, and we brought him back from Australia. We, uh, we had a budget of about $6,000 in the Medical Association. I nearly bankrupt the Students Association, but we were underwritten by the, the, the Medical Association at the time. We were able to bring him over, and that would have probably been one of his final talks. It's 2000 and, uh, 2006, we're talking about that. So um, we spent the day with Papa Tom, um, such an incredible mind, complex mind, and my fascination with Papa Tom started there. Um, I'm going to, I, I reference heavily from, he has actually two autobiographies. Not too many people have two autobiographies, but he has two, um, which we'll talk about. It. He has a novel. Um, both of the first two early ones were written by his, his uh, first wife, Lydia Davis, who was incredible, in her own right, an incredible person. Um, if you have one book to read, um, this is it. It's out of print, but it, there, you can get copies of it, and um, it's, it's called Island Boy. When he, in his, four, in his later years, he, he actually wrote Island Boy and Vaca, which is a, a story about uh, traditional Polynesian sailing um, and goes deep into Poly, Polynesian anthropology. Um, he wrote those at the same time, which he said he enjoyed. I said, was it hard writing two books? He says, no, no, I would just write one and get bored, and then I'll write the other, such as Papa Tom. So this is the forward doctor to the islands in 1954. It may be hardly respectable to publish one's mentors before the required three scores, years, and ten have passed, but our lives, now only half spent, seem unusually full. And it goes on. The Targo Medical School with its dean, Sir Charles Herkes, he's probably on one of, one of these walls here on next door, continues to provide the medical graduates a qualification that they can be proud of anywhere in the world. And we do not forget our brave little ship, the Meru, who led us so surely in this new chapter of our lives. So I'll talk about the venture of the Meru, the, the boat that you'll see that was in Boston Harbor um, uh, in, in the Charles River on the, on the title page. So Papa Tom's influence had an, an enormous effect on my life. Um, uh, I ended up, I, I did my house officer years here, um, ended up going to Boston myself, spent five years at Harvard. Uh, and also became very interested in public health and tropical medicine uh, medical training. Uh, this is uh, the late D.A. Henderson who eradicated smallpox, became a mentor for me, and I did my master's thesis with him and also trained at the NIH and also got well, quite involved politically. Came to the same conclusion that a lot of our problems in the Pacific or in under-resourced settings are an economic problem basis in the political, social. So this is outside Senator Warren. I think we were trying to advocate something at the stage about trade and things that didn't really quite work out, but it was a, it was a nice journey. I spent 12 years in the United States and came back three years. Uh, I visited a lot of the sites where Papa Tom had talked about um, in his books and uh, researched a lot there when then uh, in the, the Harvard uh, newspapers about his life. Um, Papa Thomas from rural lineage, uh, born in Rarotong in 1917, Thomas Robert Alexander Harris Davis. His maternal great-grandfather was the last traditional Poly Polynesian navigator. His grandmother was from rural lineage. His grandfather is a very interesting person, Thomas uh, 
carries, which is, he gets his name for. He ran away from school. You'll see a theme here when I'm going through, when you know Papa Tom. Uh, bought a, he had a mate's, got a mate's uh, ticket, then a master's, bought a schooner, and then sailed to the South Pacific. Uh, became a pearl trader. And uh, we were in uh, Papahiti, in Tahiti. Now it was, it was called the Society Islands back then. He met, quote unquote, a Rao Tongan princess. She was six feet, and she was visiting her Tahiti cousin. From all accounts, she was strikingly beautiful, and, I, and I, I'm sure that was the case. Married her, and they sailed back to Rarotonga. So Grandpa Harry's had, a, had an enormous effect on Papa Tom. Uh, so Grandpa Harry's operated schooners in, in Rarotonga and Tahiti uh, from 1980 to 1918. Uh, till, till, he till, till when he died. Uh, he had trade, and this is interesting when you read Papa Tong's accounts, he understood inward and outward trade. In inward trade, you bring the, the cargo trade, the bread and the butter, outwards you'd take all the, the, the copra, uh, the pearl shells and the gems. Um, he wasn't scared of danger. Hurricane season in the Cook Islands is no joke, if you ever watch the news or those who live in the Cooks understand this, but he continued trading while other schooners didn't, and made a roaring trade for this. He lost three vessels, one after another, but that didn't deter him. No one drowned, but he was making, making extra money to so replace this, the ships. So Grandpa Harry's was known as the Pearl King of the Pacific, and Tom inherited his love of the, sip, sh the sea, the ships, and Lydia calls a certain audacity from Grandpa Harry's. His parents, uh, so they were the parents, Tom's mother was an only child, and she also married, so remember, uh, Grandpa Harry's is Welsh. So there must have been a Welsh connection here. She also married a Welsh English person. I don't, we don't know, I don't have the father's name, but he was sailing in the South, say, in the South Pacific. He was one of two children, and Mary Ann suffered a lot of seasickness, so she didn't, you know, wasn't on the ship a lot. And unfortunately, shortly after Tom's birth, father left and never returned. So he, this is a quote from Tom from an interview. He was born a rover, and all I hear was hearsay. He was a soldier of fortune, served with the Anzacs in World War I, searching for new horizons and two tuberculosis, which had ex he was exposed to during the war, pulled him down. I was told he was a dreamer, impractical, a lover of music, and above all, a wanderer. So it's very interesting. You'll see some themes about this. The mother, his mother was quite, obviously, you know, imagining now raising two children was quite embittered for, embittered for this. And there were strict instructions in the boarding school. There was no correspondence to be from his father. And apparently the father did try to reach out to Papa Tom, but they never had contact. So that's, that's, that, was, that was his father. Saying that his mother remarried Tom's step-grandfather and he had a Polynesian influence. And I think that obviously the stepfather had a great influence also. Um, this was the heyday of Rarotonga in terms of the economic trade. And as you say, Grandpa Harry's, they were quite well off family. He had three sisters. Um, Mary, the oldest, went to St. Cuthbert uh, in Auckland. You remember back then in the Cooks, there wasn't any high school, and this was common for more of the wealthier uh, uh, families. Tom followed to, to King's College in 1930, um, and his two sisters were there later. Mary, who's there, lived uh, to the ripe age of 93. She actually married Anne Harvey, um, who was of Alex Harvey, AHI, was quite a well-known business. Aruria, unfortunately, she died in the 20s of TB, which was called the scowl of the Pacific back then. She, there was a lot of royal lineage. Um, she was a very good friend of Queen Salote, uh, of the king, and also her mother was a very good friend of Queen Salote. So the, just, the, the circles that they walked in was royal lineage. Uh, uh, Tia Paha lived in Rarotonga and she married uh, Jack Whittier. So that, this is her, her there on her, her 95th birthday. So the, a lot of these drawings I have, and these are from Papa Tom. Um, okay, come, uh, so he's, these are from pa Papa Tom. Uh, so he, he played, uh, he was very playful when he was a child, and used a lot of traditional games. The, it's interesting, as you see, I've got my family here. In Polynesian custom, children are extremely important. We don't make things like, you see my older boys there, you've got my younger ones there. Uh, children are involved in everything. Um, and it's interesting, he talks about, there's no stranger danger in the Pacific Island because everybody's called an uncle, a cousin, an aunt, and we just, and the children are, are very much involved in that. 
Um, he learned a lot of his uh, Polynesian fishing techniques from his mother's half-brother, who was a master of that. He climbed a lot of the tall peaks of the Rarotonga, as you see, it's a very beautiful, uh, tall, mountainous island. And like all kids in Polynesia, he raided the orchards and he said, you know, the, we could take the pawpaw and the mangoes, but the, the, the watermelons had a lot of value and they got a lot of trouble for taking the watermelons. So they got told off for the watermelons. I see Mama Kenny's just she probably reminiscing. The movies were the, the great highlight in the Pacific, the pictures. And from what I understand, there's no street lights back then and everybody would walk in um, carrying torches and they would, they, would, they would put their torches on the screen, whistles and cheers, and his uh, uncle would narrate because it was all in silent movies. So it's a fantastic uh, upbringing. Age, age nine, he repaired his family outrigger canoe and he ventured into open water. He didn't tell his mother, secret voyages he called them. And he said, I tried to paddle out of sight, but Rarotonga has a very mountainous thing, so apparently you have to get back out of the academy. No matter how I did, I had to be back for dinner. So he paddle, 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 as far as he could, not telling his mother, but then he had to come back. The first book he ever had was a Wycombe and Tomes World Atlas, like this one here. And he was fascinated by it, had every country there. And it said it helped satisfy his daydream of sailing around the world in my own imaginary boat. And he drew courses on this book and the voyages that he would later take. This was cemented when he, he, there was William Robinson uh, from uh, Massachusetts. He was sailing around the world uh, and he was first in, the, in, in, in a small boat. And he wrote his experiences in the, the 10,000 leagues under the seas. Halfway through, he went to the Cooks, and Robinson let, uh, he was there for a couple of months, and, he, in, and Papa Tom says he was very kind, and he would let him on the boat, he would let him hold the, you know, the steering wheel. They had a dugout of an Indo canoe, which was on there, and instantly, and he said for a struck of luck, he actually saw that canoe years later when he was in America. And something changed there, and he said, I resolved one day, I would make a trip that other small boats say, like Bill Robinson will remember. So this, he was only eight. So older men kept an eye on him. They taught him the knowledge of the small boats, and they, and they became almost instinctive. He came independent by an early age. He became dependent on his own resource. And this is really important, because I couldn't really understand a lot of, when you think, of, we'll talk about market economies later, free market economy. He was a very dependent on his own resources. At an early age, anticipated trouble. There was a story in age 11, he was outrigging with two old other boys and the sudden wind apparently just comes off and they panicked and he, re and he realized fear is no help in an emergency and he realized that he, he, even if he has these things, he's got to keep it to himself. And this, we'll talk about the venture of the mirror where this comes in. So a lot of very life-changing events coming up in an earlier, earlier thing. So age 12, he said he was shipped off to the King's College. No high school, which we talked about in the Cooks, and he was homeschooled. Very few Cook Islanders there at the time, unlike now. But he knew about New Zealand reading through second-hand books, but he was very surprised. There was no coconut trees in New Zealand, and he couldn't recognize the trees. The houses were different, but he said the paved roads of New Zealand were a delight, as the dusty coral roads would always have potholes. Papa Tom, I'm always fascinated. I was fascinated by, by lightning, and, turn, you could, and light, with lighting and electricity, and you could turn off with a switch, but he received many jolts to see what electricity could and could not do. And the other thing that was so striking, he would say hello to people in the cooks, but unlike in the cooks in New Zealand, people don't say hello back. And then he was told, actually, we don't do that in New Zealand elsewhere in the world. So just showing how much of a friendly environment the Cook Islands is, and this is a, a picture of, of what Auckland looked back about that. So very, very different times. So King's College in Auckland, um, as you well know, this is a, it's, it's quite an illustrious school. This is a, one of his contemporaries, uh, George Corway, who was a Ducks, uh, played international uh, rugby. Uh, he was an Oxford Rhodes Scholar. Um, actually, I think he served, um, it was something like 40 plus years at, at Oxford. Um, so very, very interesting, con uh, his contemporaries there. But his first, his, he was, there was a lot of difference. Even though he spoke good English, English, his intonation and the things he would always, sometimes he made fun of, he said. But he said the first year at King's was the year of the cane. And he said he didn't, he didn't, he thought that was okay and he kind of got over it. But he said there'd be rules for everything and he always seemed to be getting cane. The freedom was gone, but he said I never considered quitting. And he was very, he was a, he was a very good at sports. 
and initially better, but he decided then he would be a doctor. And he worked very hard, and he actually got the prize for most, most improved pupil of the school. Uh, got four more academic prizes, uh, championships in the sport, and he was well known as a boxer. And the close and loyal friends were made during that, that formative years. Um, Rarotonga has, I've never been, I'm, I'm hopefully this lecture I'll, I'll get invited to Rarotonga, but if I do it well, but Rarotonga has got a beautiful climate, and Mama Kenny will say this more than I will know, but it's 22 degrees, so it's never be beside below 15. So for, uh, for a Cook Island boy, this New Zealand would have been cold, even in Auckland. He said New Zealand was a frozen bolt, and it was a nightmare. He was always shivering. He, he put as many blankets as he could, and he wore a dressing gown to bed. But he was told, and this was a, 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 something that really changed his whole outlook to his research. He said, don't worry, you'll get used to it. And that sparked a train of thought that would later live, lead him to all the different researches and into outer space and a, a cold climatization. And he thought, wow, this is interesting. How is it they're cold and I'm not cold? So within a so he decided, in Papa Tom fashion, that he would discard his, uh, his, his extra clothing, extra blankets, wear his open shirt, and with a, with a couple of weeks, he was sleeping soundly. And he was always one for pushing the boundaries. So their school cold shower record was 10 minutes. He decided to break it, and he went for 42. So the school record was 42 minutes. And later on, he talks about that he, he couldn't feel his feet, and he went numb, but he kept on pushing. <laughs> This is Papa Tom. So he experienced the adaptive process of cold acclimatization firsthand, cook at the, at the, at the, in the showers. So he went back to the cooks, 1933 visit back. So this is the RMS Tahiti. Um, he was given a royal welcome, him and his sister. Um, the, uh, he was at the, the Queen's Palace, the Riki Chiefs. Apparently, it was an enormous uh, uh, welcoming there. His mother, he, he's. In Polynesia, not, this not only goes to the cook, but the, the, the expectation, especially if you're from a family, is high. And the expectation, and this is sometime when you're walking between two worlds, the expectation of duty is high amongst Polynesians. It would have been enormously so with, with Papa Tom. She expects that every opportunity, what was expected of her son over, as her family. So she obviously talked talk, talk to him a lot about this. and, and that. And um, she, he talks about that a lot of the, the New Zealand Cook Islands that came back, the, it was difficult coming back, and there were also d temptations with alcohol and other things as well. He had an early influence about the colonial, he talks about the colonial masters, and he also said that the alcohol thing may have been influenced by the colonial masters who did not want educated Pacific Islanders or Cook Islands in position of responsibility. We'll go back to this theme, it's a central theme. He said ed educated girls should have been given much more opportunities. And despite their capabilities, they weren't and resulted in loss of confidence. So he's thinking at a very early stage about all these, these things. I'm not going to go into the Cook Island history, but it is to, to, to briefly delve on this. Um, if you, well, obviously, the Cook Island uh, people were there for a long time, close relationship with the Tahitians. Um, and we have Spanish, Portuguese, and later British influence. You've got to remember at the time, there was a dramatic thing about the 1840s. Tahiti was armed takeover in the Pacific, so you'll see a lot of it um, protectorate. The other thing I haven't put on this was there's a lot of blackbirding. Blackbirding was slavery. A lot of the Peruvians would take uh, our Polynesian people off, and, and there was a lot of slavery. So when you see a lot of uh, protectorate, this is what the leaders at that time were worried about. They were worried about armed takeover. They were worried about blackbirding and slavery. So Queen Maki Te Ariki, this is her there, um, aligned United Kingdom to France, as, um, to the United Kingdom, because France had just occupied Tahiti. They were later annexed as a British territory, and then they became a colony of New Zealand, because New Zealand was a colony back then as well. Um, so this is the ceremony uh, there in 1900 with Lorne Ram Ramfilly, we just see here. Later on, and I won't go too much into this, uh, there was a vote. There was a big push to, to, to get rid of colonialism, and uh, Cook Islands at the moment, it's a self-governing governing territory with free association with New Zealand. And I'll go a little bit on that. I won't delve too much on that, because others were, were able to test much more about that time. So preparing for medicine. 
at an early age, he wanted to study medicine. He wanted to be a scientist. At that time, his parents wanted him to go to Central Medical School, and that's where everybody went from the Cook Islands. There was no, there was no medical graduate that had ever been to Otago. But he would only be an assistant medical practitioner, and he said, I'd always be the beck, and beck of someone else. And he didn't want that. So he knew he wanted to go to University of Otago, but he kept it quiet because he said that would have been disrespectful at the time. And also his motives were being unrespective because disrupted the order that was naturally set by the colonial masters. In the Cook Islands, people had no say. There was no elected representatives. All decisions were made by officials in Wellington and New Zealand officials. And he really had a big impact on Papa Tom. Finance was a tough. They had the 1929 crash, and this impacted the Cooks about 1932. And then there was a shipping route between Sydney and South uh, San Francisco, and that stopped. Remember, he had two, two other daughters going, uh, sisters going to boarding school. There was financial responsibility, so he stopped going back home. Um, he became very good friend with the Mizzens, became lifelong friends, and this is Mercury Island. Became very good friends with the fat, the father, Skip. Um, learned a lot about sheep and fat, uh, cattle farming, about the economics, of course. Learned how to know about the economics of, of it, um, and said it was a very good, good way of making a living, and he, and he became, also had a love of sailing with Skip and they did a lot of coastal navigation. He said that taught him a lot for future. The Depression was tough at Otago University. Uh, he had no money. Skip, he borrowed some money. It's 50 pounds, but it was a lot of money back then. But it was, as you said, a too little for a long time. But he always had a saying, the Lord will provide. And said so it always did happen. He have to, had to be self-sufficient. And he worked on the roads as a wool presser. He had horses up in Central Targa during the, 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 the summer holiday. He worked in the freezing works. A lot of other students did as well. He said a lot of other students quit. And he says, I was more, he didn't want to go back to Cooks. He really had to survive. Back then also, remember, if you're a student, you know, look, they're looking down on medical students if you're working in a sharing gang. But they knew sh he was a boxer. And he, got, he said, I got, I got, I got uh, accepted by the brethren, because you can't just go and work in, in, in these places. So he obviously was very good with people. But later on, he, tell, he acquired a taxi license. So he would go to lectures during the day, and then he would start his, his job, 5 p.m. to 3 a.m. And he said he, I, he said he was obviously short on sleep. But he said it was a much easier job than working, working in, in manual labor. Um, and he slept anywhere he could. He's got a lot of stories I won't go into about his, his uh, taxi journeys and who different clients he picked up. He, la he married um, Maria Lydia Henderson, otherwise known as Lydia Davis, uh, September 4th, 1940. And this is a, a, a drawing that he did. Obviously, didn't have a lot of money, and he got married at the, de at the, 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 the married registry. A very simple cer ceremony. Um, no one was there. So this is interesting. Some of royal lineage having a very... A nondescript wedding. So I imagine, I don't know if he don't think he really told his mother about this, because I don't think she would have been too happy. He had three sons, uh, John, Tim, and uh, Teddy Moana. Um, the dogs are very much an influence in Papa Tom. He mainly had this, this a dog. It's not just a dog, it's a massive dog. When I talked to uh, Brigadier McMahon, he says, that dog, and he was called Tiger. He was a huge dog. And so much so, he said, Tiger would kind of roam the area. And... Um, People were scared of Tiger. Tiger got poisoned later on, so you imagine there were some neighbours that weren't so high with Tiger, but he, th he said Tiger was an intelligent dog. He always, he always thought his animals were very intelligent. He could communicate. Tiger knew his winner. They say Papa Tom loved dogs. Unfortunately, they got divorced at a later age. I, I think reading through, Lydia was an incredible person, um, and, uh, but they got divorced, and reason being probably was the due to he wanted to come back to the Cooks. Cooks, for him, actually, you'll see the trend, was actually above marriage. That the such of his duty and his, his, uh, um, his role of the society, of, of what the Cook Islands meant to him. He had early experiments, of course. He had a cold flat, and he said this was uninhabitable, in his words, but he said, it had an outhouse, so he's like, I imagine back then, it, he said it was, it was as cold as inside as outside, and that the toilet was in an outside. But, you know, of course, Papa Tom had to do experiments. So he would spend hours, spending happy hours in the outside, showing that uh, in the closed, we had means to live in the closed environment and outer space, and he would show his friends his experiments. And he had an, an amazing imagination. He said, I was an addict 
addict of science fiction, and he would go to the children's ward, and he said some of these were not so professional because they always had the latest comics. And Flash Gordon was one of his favorite people, and he used to read about the space heroes and used to think about Ada Space. But he came to the conclusion from reading the comics in his own initial experiments that he wondered whether we had the technology to, to support life in outer space. So early, early, early uh, things we'll talk about. This is a thing you may know about, is the St. Clair surfer experiments. A lot of his colleagues, his contemporaries, uh, would go surfing, and he was always fascinated in the winter. So what he did, he actually did, <laughs> and he jokes about this, he, he said, I will provide the cups of teas, and Lydia and I have the place, but one thing, you have the rectal thermometer, because that is the most accurate way. So surely enough, they would, they would do it. So at five-minute intervals, he would, he would test the temperature. The hypothesis be, being, you take the temperature in cold water immersion, your temperature should drop. That was the hypothesis. But something that would change the course of his life happened. So we start at 36, and sure enough, you do measurement temperature, but the temperature wouldn't drop until you came outside. And he says, you know, I was ethical. I didn't, there wasn't a probably ethics committee back then. But he said, I needed to push it. So he went to 50 minutes. And he said by that stage, he, he couldn't feel his feet. I think, and he suffered hypothermia from reading his account because he said my, my body temperature dropped to 34 and I, I, I was shivering for, you know, afterwards for a day. But, but he, he talked about the chemical heat, chemical heat production would only mean once documented in literature. So this is a very formative thing. Papa Tom's Otago contemporaries were quite incredible people. Um, many of which have been spoken to about this lecture. So at the back there, we see a young uh, Sir Barrett Boyles, um, Greenland surgeon, uh, one of the uh, foremost fathers in heart valve, sur uh, heart valve sur uh, surgery. We see uh, a young John Parr. You'll see the, his name out there. Uh, ophthalmologist and the John Parr Prize is named after. Um, this is Bill Adams. Bill Adams is a graduate in 1924. I don't know how he's president of the Medical Students Association, but apparently may maybe that there was certain things happening, but very, you know, distinguished lot there. This is some of his contemporaries. I went back and found his photo from 1945 in the Hockham. He used to be outside the Linda Ferg, and now they've gone, so they're down the Hockham if everybody wants to know. I couldn't find Papa Tom, and then I realized actually this is the war years, and we'll talk about that. A lot of the, the, the students actually had to go and work before they graduated, but one person you'll see here, does anybody know this person? Can you sort of see this more, a darker gentleman? Has anybody got any ideas who this person may be? One of his content, one of the most famous graduates of this university, Ratu. This is Ratu Mara. So this is uh, an incredible uh, individual. This is the father of the uh, father of Fiji. So Ratu Mara is not the first actual medical graduate of Fijian descent. Ratu Dovi um, is 1935, but he never went into politics. And uh, Ratu Sukuna, I think, wasn't happy about this, and um, he said, "You can't continue on the medicine." Ratu Mara really wanted to, but he was funded by Ratu Sukuna. And back in those days, I, I imagine you. you you, you don't have much choice, but he was grooming for the future. So he left and he went to Oxford. He been on later on, became first Prime Minister of Fiji, President of Fiji, honorary law degree from uh, Otago. Fantastic cricketer, and you just see in the photo, he was quite tall when he had the university high, high jump record. So formative years, he finished requirements in 1943, and that's probably why I couldn't find him in the photo. And talking to uh, Brigadier McMahon, he said, you know, they were short back then, and as soon as you had enough qualifications, you were out. You know, you had to go and kind of work in the wards, and money was tight. He did some uh, work at Seacliff Hospital um, uh, to learn psychiatry, and, and that still, still remains the range there. And then he went to Auckland, uh, worked in Auckland, Rotorua, and Green Lane. And just remember, back then, Green Lane uh, ended up being a, a world-class institution. Uh, worked uh, with a, a mentor, Sir, uh, Sir Robert Rob Douglas, um, and became very good friends. And um, Sir Douglas, I mean, many of you would read, was quite an opinionated person in his own true right. Um, talk, he, his, a lot of his writings were the basis of the health reforms when we went to the six cheese 
the, 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 the not an acronym, but he also was had early writings. He was the Chancellor of Auckland and really uh, one of the fathers of, of the Auckland Medical School. So it's interesting that the personality, that's probably what they got on. But Sir Douglas said, this is the worst professional decision you can make, Tom, and really advised him not to go to Cook Islands because the job was advertised. He applied four times and didn't get it. But this is a theme, and this is not a theme unusual to many Pacific Islanders. It's an obligation, if not fulfilled, the con it would become a matter of consciousness. There was a lot of colonial racism, and he thought that the reason, he was well qualified, but they didn't want an educated Cook Island to be in charge. But he said, you know, he's very, very persistent, he gets there. And so they think, oh, well, they must have known in a Calic, and he ends up going. 1945, he sails in the, the, the Māori formula to, uh, on the ship, uh, with his Lydia and his son John, um, becomes the chief medical officer. It's a very neglected service. He says that there was much to do. Um, so there was no laboratories. He got the laboratory there. There was a lot of neglected surgical problems. He did a surgical list, um, rag and bottle stuff, appendicectomies, uterine things. It's quite incredible what they were able to do. But back then, I would say when you have an MBCHB, the surgery really kind of meant something. I'm not to say we don't we, we do that. I would say it's more diagnostic. Back then, they really were trained in surgery. So Papa Tom really considered himself a surgeon. He transformed the medical services, introduced public health measures, reduced infant mortality, brought in BCG for the TB vaccine, introduced legislation about food and beverage, introduced garbage collection. Because remember, there was a lot of uh, vector-borne diseases. Lymphatic lymphoviruses was rife through the Cook Islands. So this is where you get swelling of the, you get, uh, of the lymphatics. You get a very elephantitis of the leg. He started the nursing school. He understood that all the root causes were public health and economic basis. So that was really profound. Uh, he did do uh, some more training in Sydney and got his DTMH there. Um, just going to put a little pop quiz for the, uh, the medical registrars and students. What's all we'll do later with it? I know the older doctors will probably know what this is. What's the diagnosis here? What's he looking for? Well, we've got an infectious disease physician in the back there. The older doctors will know this one. So leprosy, probably, I imagine. Lim remember, leprosy affects three things. It's get your hyperpigmentation of the skin lesion, loss of sensation, and large nerves. So that's probably what he was looking for, the large nerves, because you can biopsy it. I don't know if that's true. Maybe he was seeing for florist, but that's kind of what I think he was doing, because this is, this is, I cut this from a video. When you see him examining him, he was examining all the nervous systems. So leprosy, still in the Pacific, not common, but it's, it's, it's hanged on in there. Um, and this is a, a, a picture of Papa Tom and uh, the nursing school. So um, from earlier, uh, you know, the, we talked about the Cook Islands. During the hurricane season, they shot up shop. All the schooners are off. Uh, there's no boats in the harbour. He was a member of the sailing club. He knew how to sail. Morse code back, and then he said, you know, I got a, I got a message, da 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 Something was happening. Children were dying. There's about 18 children he goes on were dying. And he, so he knew he needed to, to go to one of the outer islands. But no one would sail with him. So he, he forced two of those other people and they sailed in the wreck wind. And then, they, and then he, they, the, the locals made a huge bonfire, directed them, and he got there. And he treated all the, 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 the kids. He diagnosed this as a meningitis with penicillin and there were no more deaths. So this is pretty remarkable. You know, you're the only doctor for an island, pretty much, and then you're going against in the middle of winter and then and in, the, in the storm years uh, and sailing to save people. And this is the thing. This is the theme of, of Papa Tom's life, you know, getting the call, he would always go. Of course, he's got to deliver kids while he's there. So one of the kids he delivered, he, you know, he was there and they named him Papa Tom Davis. Um, after about six years, he had itchy feet. And he said, I achieved everything else. And he was such a curious person. He asked, he, 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 he obviously got well with his, uh, his, lecture, his um, uh, Otago. And he wrote to uh, Dean Sir Charles Herkus and said, you know, would you come and do, someone come and do a medical uh, uh, survey? And actually, uh, Sir Charles actually said, I'll come. <laughs> I'll lead it. And he was an expert in bacteriology. And so he actually came, and they became very, very, obviously very good friends, and he actually encouraged them to seek up other opportunities. It's interesting, 1951, there was, an, there was, a, there was a chance meeting that would change the course of his life. Uh, this gentleman here was Harold J. Courage, who was a zoologist. 
uh, anthropologist, and then he, he obviously was struck by Davis. And he said, would you like to come to Harvard? And he was astounded. He said, you bet I would, but I need the money. And he said, he pretty much said, if you get the money, I'll sell to Harvard. And Coolidge thought this was kind of a, a toke. But we'll talk about this later. So he was able to find the money, got $3,000 scholarship. The New Zealand government gave him $30. Obviously, they didn't want him to go. The New they did not want him to go. They, when they found out about his plans, they wanted him to go to Britain. They said, well, if you want to go, we'll go to Britain. He says, and he didn't want to go there. He said, and they told him, if you ever go there, you will never come back. He went anyway. He also, he, they got told to hang on, hang on, because your pension, you only have to work so many years and you'll get pension. He still went. So this is interesting. So he bought a boat, it was called the Sobre, later named the Miru, as is a Polynesian, one of the Polynesian, through the Polynesian gods, and fixed it up. And they sailed from, um, in the middle of winter, I, I still can't comprehend this. In the middle of winter, with two kids, similar to my age, he traveled with his wife. And he said the wife was a pretty incredible, this is why I think Lydia Davis needs a, 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 a enormous recognition, the wife going on this trip, but she would, never got seasick and she was a good cook and she talks about Whoever's been on an ocean very the, the value of a good cook, and she kept the men there. But he couldn't get a U.S. visa. He left New Zealand without a U.S. visa, which is really interesting. So he sailed through Wellington to New Zealand, from New Zealand to Peru, the Panama Canal, lost the eastern seaboard. He uh, had two other crew members. He had four storms, big storms. They ran out of food. He lost 25 kilo, uh, pounds on this. John, the son, had measles. There were some times they were, they were trapped there for four days. It was so heavy. This is the first, first time a small boat had ever crossed the roaring 40s in, the, in, 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 um, in this years. This was picked up by Time mag magazine. Because, of course, Papa Tom, wanting to study anthropology, wanted to just prove the, con the, 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 the theory about that Polynesians came from Peru. So he had to do a bit of anthropology on the way, such as Papa Tom. You've got to kill a few birds with his son stop, and he did this. This was dramatic. You can imagine, apparently he had a royal welcome. This is picked up on the Harvard Gazette, on, on the Crism, uh, Crimson, and it was picked up by Time. It talks about he certainly will rank as a student who reached Harvard the hardest way. This is at, uh, those who have been from Boston, there's a Charles River that runs through Boston. At the end of the Charles River, there's a Museum of Science. This is where this ship stopped. On the right side is Boston, on the, on the left side is Cambridge, you'll see MIT. And I work a bit further up from that. And um, this is the uh, president of the Harvard School of Public Health. This is uh, General, Brigadier General James Simmons. Um, when you know your war history, he was uh, the head of public health and preventative medicine in the United States Army. So formative figure. Um, and he was two months, was six weeks late for his course. And the brigadier comes down to the docks to see this. So this is quite an, you know, this is Harvard we're talking about. And uh, interesting enough, so we'll, I'll kind of go through the years, but he was elected to class president. He writes the book. He was, he said he was kind of like, he had to give a lot of public lectures. He said, you know, Americans, they'll never use a good opportunity to raise money. So he was shipped off in a lot of like meet and greet, wine and dines, and he would talk about his experience of the, of the Muru, about all these experiences. They were fascinated by him. Um, later on, he, he, he got a job at, because remember, he couldn't go back to Cox, and he was told again, he tried to go back to Cox, they said, you, we're not going to come back, this is the colonial government. Um, so he got a job at the Harvard School of Public Health, got into research. I won't, I, I won't go into this in a lot of detail, because there's so much in here, but he studied a lot of stuff about um, uh, uh, different uh, research in a lot of different institutions, and uh, military things, did work in the Himalayas and uh, um, in Alaska. Um, later on, did some consulting, and then we talk about this, uh, his work on the on the space program. This is this is really profound. This kind of when you're reading a book, this kind of makes you sit up and just go, "Wow!" Around about 1955, I was giving a paper at Atlantic City, that's in New Jersey. My paper was interrupted, and I was told to get in a new a next plane to Washington. So apparently, a couple men. They pulled him off stage. He was in the middle of giving a lecture. They pulled him off stage. They put him in a room. And he says, you know, what about, what about my bags? Oh, we've packed up your bags. What about my family? Your family being told you need to come with us. The president has a mission for you. 
each of us, at Walter Reed, so Walter Reed is a research institute around about New England. You know, this is the military hospital for America, still there, and the research institute. We were, at Walter Reed, 20 of us were gathered. We were all told that we we're going to put a program to put man on the moon. Each of us were assigned a chapter. Mine was an environment looking to require to put two to three men to, um, to live. Also, the type of environment that was expected on the moon and to land in places that were temperature would be tolerable. Beyond Walter Rouge was outer base, outer bounds. What we were about to do was top secret. To make a long story short, we came up with a Bible for the top Apollo program. So really incredible. Just think about this. This is a Cook Island the, who made his own way to Otago. Now he is at, Kennedy wants to put man on the moon. And I've talked to other people and they said, of course you need a Cook Islander. Who else would do the job? So I actually got, the, I, I hunted this, this down, actually, of the original thing. So he wrote this article in 1961. He was determined that man would be on the moon, Papa Tom. He knew all of the Mercury 7 intimately. So these were celebrity back in the day. You've got people like John Glenn, Alan Shepard, knew them intimately. Um, this is, he helped put the first monkey on space and the moon, on the moon in, in space. So just thinking about this, so this is Papa Tom. I haven't got... NASA, this is like looking at the NASA arch archives. I'm pretty sure this is Papa Tom, but they don't have a Newton, but I'm pretty interested. And this is Abel. So if you know your NATO phonetic alphabet, Abel, Baker. So the first two monkeys were called Abel and Baker. So they're very brave monkeys. I mean, they're squirrel monkeys, but I don't know. They, they wrapped them up and they put them in space. So this is him taking a week through. So they put the monkeys in, the, in a rocket and they, they launched Abel and Baker to space. And this was a big deal because what this showed that human life could be sustained in space. So this was monumental. And you've got to put the time. This is, we're talking also about the Cold War. The Russians have put dogs in space. So this was a big thing. This was kind of one up on the Soviets. And this was Life magazine. So for Papa Tom to be involved with this was a really, really big deal. I can't understate how big a deal this was for put, to put uh, monkeys in space. Unfortunately, against Papa Tom's recommendation, they were all wired up. They had electrodes in the heart, and they said, I didn't want them to do this, but they shipped them around, and they wanted to lift the morale of the military, to lift the morale of the astronauts, and they took them on a tour for three days, and he said, oh, the monkey came back in a bad state, and they had an affected lead. So he, Papa Tom tried to take the, the lead out, and unfortunately, the, the, the monkey during the nest ties had an arrest. So this is Papa Tom trying to give the monkey CPR. They worked on the monkey for for an hour. He talked about this later on in life, and I actually, I've, when I met him, I talked about this. He had a deep affinity with animals, and um, it, this really struck him hard, but he, didn't, he said, I never lost another animal. So this, this American, this, 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 you can still see Abel. Abel's taxidermied and is actually in the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. And this is the Pivotal Papal that talks about this, if you want to read, it's a classic in space. He was prolific in publishing, published very interesting articles, there's about, about 30 of them, and this is sort of, it gives you all really based on human physiology with cold and heat. Um, the calls to come back to the, the Rarotonga were, were, were starting. Remember, we talked about the history. Uh, 1962, there was a vote. 1965, Albert, Sir Albert Henry comes in. Uh, so there was a lot of change. There was a lot of change. I don't I mean uh, others will testify the change in terms of the Riki system, but there were calls for him to go. So not everybody was happy about the changes um, Sua, but w w was making. I think that's a fair testimony. One of them was uh, his cousin, who, who also was of royal lineage, Amagi um, Nui uh, Teremoni Ariki. And she, she said, when someone of that, he said, when someone of that stature tells you to come back, you obey. And that's he decided to come back. And he knew his time would come, that he would have to come back to the Cooks. And he studied finance and economics. He said that was always the underpinning. In 1971, he founded the Democratic Party. And of course, like a Papa Tom, he had to sell back. So he sailed back from Boston. Winthrop was just outside of Boston. And he sailed with his, 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 his son was called Bobby uh, or, or Terry, um, but, uh, Robert Terry Mamana and two, two other crew. And then he had to stop it because election in 1972, so he had to fly back from Fort Lauderdale, which is in Florida, back to the Cooks, and he won a seat in Parliament, became leader of the opposition. 
And then he went back to Fort Lauderdale because he got to get the boat back and he sailed it back to Rarotonga. So just incredible person, you know. We, I would have thought once is enough, but no, you've got to come back. Can't miss a good sailing. And Cook Island politics, so this wasn't his ambition. And he talks about it. He said, never studied politics. He said, I never wanted to be politics, but he understood it was a means to an end. And he noticed there was a high amount of people coming to New Zealand for opportunities and work, and he wanted to help stop that. And he said, paradise is not enough. People need more to this. And he encouraged free enterprise in the market economy. Um, I'll just brush a bit on Albert Henry. This is also a famous son of the Cook Islands. It's interesting. Um, both political rivals, but they were, they were life deep long friends and they trusted each other. They combined trust on each other. They talked about different things. They both wanted self-determination for the Cooks. That was the common goal. And they had re mutual recognition, but they had different approaches. Uh, from what I read, uh, Albert was much more socialist and Papa Tom Marie says almost communist. He, remember at that stage you had the war, border side strikes and he tried to start a lot of stuff in terms of the unions and the cooks. And more, he was more reliant on New Zealand's socialist policies. The 1978 election was a very interesting time. Um, and what happened actually, cut a long story short, and others will testify of this who know the history better than I do, but the, the Cook Islands uh, party won. But what they had done, they flew back New Zealanders, because you, if you're a New Zealand citizen, you couldn't vote in the Cooks, but they flew them back and won the election but they did it with government money. And so what happened, he got done for uh, uh, obviously uh, election uh, uh, corruption and this result was overturned. That's how Papa Tom ended up and then he was later stripped of his knighthood. But, you know, reading back in the, is, is that Sir Albert, said, when I, when I read, read into this, he said, you know, I knew it was a risk, but he said it was a risk worth taking. So it's very interesting. Um, so he became Cook Island Prime Minister in 78 in his first speech, and he talks about this, is the, when he gave this speech to us as medical students, talk about this. He wanted his people to succeed. Go plant. Do whatever you can to make a living for yourself or a better living. Do anything you like as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, it doesn't hurt the environment, and is not criminal. Go do it. And he thought, you know, well, that, that speech is lost in everybody, but he said it wasn't. Within three months, everybody caught on. Everybody wants someone themselves to be better, and for the kids, it's a motivation that you don't need to go to school for. That's how powerful this thing is. He got rid of the marketing board because everything had to come through the kind of colonialist government. And he said, look, you go do it, you go market, I will support you 110%. He opened up the economies, in, increased food export, increased factories. He was able to get a, a, seven, uh, a 6767 to line in the, land the cooks, not for tourism, but for export. So he really boomed. And if you look at a lot of the, the, the data, GDP went up, factory goes up, uh, uh, employment goes up, and this is, this is the things uh, that he introduced. This is the government of the time. So uh, this is a picture from the, the parliament on the, of the Cook Islands. So very um, illustrious people in there. But not everybody got on with him. And he had some very strained relationships, very strained relationship with Dong, David Long. And David Long, is, they did not get on. Um, and uh, you can listen to some very interesting uh, things. Remember, also, we had the uh, ANZUS Agreement, 1987. The Cooks allowed, actually, nuclear, with them, uh, nuclear uh, ships to come into the Cooks. And Davis was more aligned to the US. This is very strained with the Longy government. And there also were post-Nally conflicts. And I, I think it's fair to say sometimes he had a difficult personality in terms of you probably couldn't argue with him. If he thought it was right, it was right. And he didn't, I think that kind of actually led to his downfall, which may be in, you know, in terms of things. But he tried to pass a, pass a budget three times and it wasn't be able to pass. And he says his own party turned on me. He had a vote of non -com no confidence and he was ousted in 1987. He reflects back on this. And I think this is the humility of, of Papa Tom because he went there, he knew that it wasn't going, he wasn't going to be popular, but he did it because it was the right thing for his country, and he tried to help the people. And he said, you know, people are always trying to cut you down, especially in Parliament. And people used to call me the monkey man because I put monkeys in space. And I've just told you how profound putting monkeys in space. So you're talking about space race. So I think it's just, it's almost quite sad we hear these comments because what he did, and he didn't take resent that, but he took it in his stride. So I think this is, this is quite interesting. 
he revitalized traditional Polynesian sailing and he was always, he had early visits, uh, you know, Sir Peter Buck, uh, a lot of the anthropologists, a lot of the, the older Polynesian uh, people were very interested in anthropology for the reason that people need to know their history and culture. And he talks about what, is, what are we a people if we don't know our history and culture? And he wanted to revitalize this. He was an, a master builder, designer, and traditional navigator. He had three different large, large uh, buckers. Um, he sailed to Tahiti, Samoa. He was a founder of the Cook Island Voyaging. Um, so he showed that it could be done. And it was an immense amount of pride to the Cook Island people. He had two, delay, two other marriages. Uh, pa, uh, Teriki, Teriki, Eriki, Lady Davis. So she was from royal lineage and um, married in 1979. She had nine children of herself after her husband died. And I think it's fair to say they had a difficult relationship at time. Um, pa was a very strong lady and she, she would talk, you know, I did not marry a politician to become a first lady. I was born a first lady. So, so you can imagine there was, a, a, there's a lot of stories in there. Uh, she was an amazing woman in her own right. This is actually her as a young lady, whereas um, Prince Philip. She wrote um, actually the words to the Cook Island National Anthem and Sir Tom wrote the music and she died in 99. He died at a young age. He later married Layla, Lady Carla Davis, who was an American nutritionist, and they got married in 2000. They separated 10 months before, before his death and she's, as far as I know, still alive in Australia. Um, he had many awards, and um, including an honorary doctorate from Otago, and this is him here, a 2005. Um, and then eventually, I, I remember this when he came over. He was still in Australia when I met him, and he would go talk about, I have to go back to my people. I have to go back to my people. And he, after a, a short stint as a, cook, a, a high commissioner for Cook Islands, he then travelled back to Australia, and he died at age 90. Uh, uh, and he's buried uh, in the capital in Rarotonga. Interestingly, he's buried near um, uh, Albert Henry as well, so he's considered one of the most famous sons. Legacy, this is um, uh, Kiki Moati's father, uh, former Prime Minister Tere Papi Moati, um, who credits, this is both of them, he's done much for the health of the country. He's reinforced that public health and approach to the Cook Island Islands people that even when we're rich in the years gone by, we've been able to sustain a very healthy population through a public health approach to the health of the people. So enormous things. And he talks about that he really revitalized the, the private enterprise in Cook Islands. Uh, there's a scholarship named after him. The HRC Top Scholarship is named after him. It's, it's quite a good one to get. $600,000 over four years. Our Associate Dean, um, uh, Dr. Diane Asikapawana, she has been a recipient. And then also, what well, we hear yesterday, we've got Scotty there they're from the, the, the Pacific uh, Island Centre. So there's a new room, and it's actually been, it's been named in his honour, so you can uh, have lunch in the Sir Thomas Davis room. So that's a brief uh, review of uh, an incredible individual. Um, I've done this talk just really to, it's for our Pacific youth, it's for students and faculty. I think this, this person is an incredible individual. And I hope I've done the Cook Island people proud in talking about him. Happy to take questions. Mataki Miata. Thank you, Xavier. Questions? Must be questions, I'm sure. Xavier, I was intrigued by this 38 foot catch that he uh, got. Quite an expensive item. Where would he get the money for that? I mean, that's a big ticket item. I don't think it was in very good repair when he got it. He had spent a year working on it, but he um, used his, all his life savings on that. He actually used his whole life savings. So he was, I think as soon as he got an idea, he went for it. And um, he didn't have the scholarship at that stage either. So he was said, he got told he would get the scholarship, but he didn't have the actual money. So he really kind of cut ties and had moved to work on this boat. Um, so I'm not too sure how he, but he's, he was always re resourceful. But it wasn't in great condition when he got it. So he, he fixed it up. He spent a year fixing it up before he, sell, so he actually sell, sold it, okay. roughly about that. And those traditional Barkers, Indonesian yeah. vessels yes. you showed us, was he involved with the building of them as well as the sailing? He built, yes, he built the first one. He actually built it on his veranda. Do you, were you there, Mama Kenny? 
he built it on his veranda. Apparently, his, his house is about two to three kilometers from the sea. And about 600 people carried this vaka, cook line drumming, and took it to the sea. It was a really big deal, but they, they picked it up and then they brought it to the sea, such as they were so proud that they, that, you know, that they, of this, this, this vaka. Mm. You still, apparently, I think it's they're still there, actually. Some of them they've, they've uh, restored. Oh, I've, I might put on, I've got uh, Kiki Amoate. Um, Kiki, I might un ask and unmute you. Did you want to say some words? Uh, how, can we unmute Kiki? Uh, uh, can you unmute there, Kiki? So, uh, Can well, thank you, uh, thank you, Xavier. Uh, get on, everybody. Um, look, Xavier, I think you've uh, not thank you have uh, done us proud as a as a as one of our students and as as, as a Tongan speaking uh, uh, on behalf of our Pacific people. And I think this is the this is the exciting thing that I see that um, from our lens across uh, our people that we should highlight the need um, to to re-look at some of the events and some of the, you know, the, the fantastic journey and contributions, not just to the health sector, but to the, to the, to the governance structures of our countries. Um, and there's many people like this uh, throughout the Pacific, as you highlighted, not just the Cook Islands, but also Fiji. Uh, and you have your people in Tonga that, that does this, and of course, uh, throughout New Zealand. Um, and uh, that's a very comprehensive uh, outline that you've managed there. There's obviously some more depth to it, but really, uh, thank you very much uh, for for putting that on. And um, Mama Pariki, I was talking to today um, to uh, to say that uh, uh, this was happening, and I think for them we'll get the recording of what's happened. Uh, and I'm sure the Cook Island people would also like that to be seen uh, on their media networks uh, somewhere. Certainly from the Pacific Medical Association group, we would like to see this uh, talk of yours uh, posted on our website. Uh, if that's uh, if you're agreeable to that, and uh, also thank you to the Cook Island people, Mama Kenny, and your group, uh, our ministers, uh, for being there today. Thank you, Xavier. Okay. Thank you, Kiki. No, definitely we can make that available. Any other questions? Before we go on, uh, this uh, is recorded. This this talk is recorded, and it will be on our YouTube. Uh, site, the uh, alumnus uh, YouTube site, and if people have trouble accessing it, contact me or Xavier and we'll uh, lead you to where this recording can be looked at again. Any other questions people have? Any comments? Mama Kenny, did you, did you have any, with, I mean, because you, Mama Kenny is one of our cook, I'm not putting her a spot, but um, I mean, um, just in terms of any interactions you would have lived through some of these times um, or, or just any, any thoughts at all? You can. I think first of all I'd like to say thank you Xavier for the presentation. I, because I come from another island, I don't live in Rarotonga, I heard about uh, Papa Tom's story when he came to the Cook Island on the boat, you know that was way back, but um, to be sitting here and also listening to the story, to the history. It makes me proud of him, you know, as a person. And also, uh, he's related to my husband uh, because he's my husband's uncle, who's the cousin to his mother. So um, yeah, it's a, it's just amazing story and his journey um, as a Cook Island. Um, a man and that um, being respected by a lot of our community out there. So thank you so much. I, I think I learned so much about this tonight, uh, the story that we never heard, you know, back home in the island. So, yeah, thank you so much for uh, asking me to be part of this uh, for your lecture, and I appreciate so much. Uh, Um, hello, Olgeta. Um, my name is Lena Isno, and I'm I am an Ivanuatu. And Xavier, thank you so much for um, highlighting, um, you know, one of our alumni, and especially from the Pacific. 
um, more importantly from the Cook Islands. I acknowledge our Cook Island uh, community members in here. And I think, you know, I'm from a generation, the new generation now, uh, the millennials, uh, we've, we've learned so much. And what your talk has highlighted tonight, uh, today is that we are resilient, you know, the Pacific people are resilient and, and the new generations coming in today, I am just inspired by, um, by Papa Tom's um, ability to not be afraid to take, to go on adventures, to make mistakes to put himself out there, to be an advocate for his people, not just for his people. What he did was inspirational all throughout the world. I mean, he even put a monkey on the moon, so, and in space, I mean, you know, um, there's a big goals and, and anybody can do it. You know, we all put our minds to it. So um, thank you so much for highlighting that. And, and more importantly to say that, um, the adventures are there. It's up to us, our mindsets, to be able to actually, uh, you know, fit ourselves in there. The support is there. And yeah, let's not be afraid to take those risks and go forth. Thank you. Mm. Nice message. Any other comments that you would like to make? Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I am a Cook Island scholar here at the University of Otago and it's a joy to hear stories about our people, especially here um, with a colleague that works in the medical school. So thank you for that. I have two questions. One first is a request <laughs> that you might come and share uh, this lecturer version of it, perhaps, um, perhaps with a history programme. Um, or even to Tumu, where we are often having these conversations about new histories that are being written and revisited amongst younger uh, Cook Island and Pacific scholars, at least in the humanities space. I know you and I have talked about this a little bit. Um, my second question is um, more about your, your kind of research, I guess, for this, um, for this talk. I come from a literary studies background and I have written a lot about Papa Tom's uh, novels. So I wondered um, if you might talk a little bit about what you thought of his writing. <laughs> and if you talked to anyone else that had worked with him on those books, particularly Makutu, which many people don't know, is probably the first novel published in the Pacific by an indigenous Pacific person. Doctors haven't got neat writing and they're not normally the best writing <laughs> the image, but I. It's interesting, his early books were with Lydia. So you've got to, in trying to, they work quite well. She's very descriptive. He's kind of very much a matter, of, he's got a, his, a matter of fact writing. Like he's always, you can see his mind working. Like he's always cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. And he's a, he's a scientist. Like even when he talks about economics, he talks about, uh, well, ec politics, it's got a measure and the measure is the dollar. It's, so he was very much, so I, I really enjoyed his writing. He's very deep, very well researched. His traditional writings uh, are just well researched. Baka is an extraordinary book. The one you mentioned, the novel, I can't get a copy. I'm getting a copy shipped over actually from UK. So I, it's one I had, I didn't actually know about until doing this research. But I, I really enjoyed his writing. It's not fast reading. I, I have to say, when I read his books, I. I read it over a couple of months almost because it's something you just got to soak up because you sort of, you, I, I, I showed some things, you've got to sort of put it in context what he's saying, like, you know, about the, the monkeys in space. And so I'm like, what is he just saying there? Like, you know, because you're putting it in context of where things are. So I find a lot of his stuff, he just did so much that you have to kind of step back and go, hang on, what did he just, did he just say there? That's crazy. You know what I mean? So that's why I think the writing is, is, I really enjoy it, but he's very descriptive. He's very exact. All his writings have dates and he, you know, so I just really enjoy it. But he, he actually partners very well with Lydia. Lydia's more descriptive. She's, she mostly talks about like what she was wearing for the wedding and what him is about his, that he's high cheekbones and things. So they're, they're a beautiful writing combination. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I'm a very happy, more than happy to share this lecture in any, any forum. So always be happy. And also, it's, there are some other uh, alumni I've talked about on there. On there. So there's a, a few that I think I would love to do. I've actually, Scotty and I were 
at lunch yesterday at the Pacific Centre with Tang Lima, and we talked about um, at the Pacific Island Centre, we used to have a, a, a tapa map with a lot of our alumni. And we talked about actually having a space where you have the alumni profiled because all of us, we stand on the giant, uh, shoulders of giants. And for me, as an alumni of Otago and of this medical school, I love reading about not just Pacific, but other alumni, because that's actually what we take forth when we go. And when we do these adventures, like even though I'm thinking going to Boston, I wanted to give up six weeks, wanted to go in, but I know that I was forging a path for people coming in the future. So I just had to stick it out. And that was what Papa Tom thought, that he had to succeed. Coming to Otago University, he, there, was no, there was no plan B. He had to exceed. He had to find a way, and I, he knew that. And I think that is that, this thing about fate and destiny. He knew that he was, and it says you get a lot of this thing of when he's writing, that it was kind of, it was almost kind of fortuitous. And even his death, I remember sitting with, I would, we talked for the day, and he was very restless about going back to the Cooks, but I think he kind of, it's remarkable, he died very shortly after that. So a lot of the writing you think about this is it's, it's very futuristic writing. It's very much descriptive and so it's very different writing. Yeah. So hopefully, that, but I'd love to share with the humanities students. So thank you for that question, and thank you, uh, Emma, for all the great work you do with our, our students. Any other questions? Other people got a comment to make? Anybody online at all? Someone online. Okay. Is there one? Anybody else online? Any other the Cook Island communities have any other comments? <laughs> All righty. Um, Kiki, you didn't have any any other final words at all. Um, I think it's uh, it's it's really a, a credit to yourself, uh, Xavier, to um, to show your leadership in. In, uh, in, in, in focusing on things around that are important and could actually slip away. So, you know, I do want to circle around and, and say thank you very much for, for your thoughts. Um, and uh, in a way, you are following those sort of footsteps um, at the early age. So, but, but thank you very much. I think that's what I say. And, and, and certainly, I had a, a, a quick chat about to the families around uh, to say that this was happening. They were very happy with that. Uh, and so that's probably the, the, another important component, but uh, for all of us to learn and to hear and maybe to even think about uh, looking at others uh, within our own vicinities and other people around the, the, you know, the regions, um, you've highlighted the need for us to do that. So thank you very much. I appreciate the presentation. And from the Cook Island community, metaki uh, yotupaka. Kia ora Yeah, thank you, Kiki. And I just also like to acknowledge the... Uh, um, Sir Thomas Davis family um, and this opportunity. Mama Kenny, would you be okay to close us in prayer? Would that be okay? Just acknowledge the Cook Island community and just acknowledge uh, everybody for coming in uh, on this night and being able to share this uh, this lecture with you. Te a kau tia tu nei te a tua to matu a koro anga iru tu yako te a tua ko kite matu te a nga mane te a nga kite pakari te a tua tate i me tua tane papa Tommy Rabe iru tu i tona ora anga ki a ka mita ki a rako te a tua ki a riro te i akra anga te a tua no to matu i te tangata kuki airani pera kato e te a tua ta matu o mapu ki a akra tika te a tua te a nga mane e pera kato e te a tua Pene ki a rauka i a rātū i te akamaru iru i tōra, tō rātū tūranga. I rauka i a te atua i te papa, i te rave mi tōna mengite anga i te atua e tai ua mai i tōna pakari anga i tāna anga anga mi taki i rave. A karanga ui a te atua i rutu i te ia nei au. Tō mātou me tua tapue i a ka mi taki i a te kite pakari o te ia me tua tāne. Pera katoa i te atua tōna kōpū tangata kā tōtoa. Te aka mītaki nei mātou e te e tua i rutu i te atianga nei. Tō ura tāwini koe o ki ko Saivia Woka koe e te e tua te i irinaki e te i aru aru e te e tua i te kimi marama lo runga i te ia me tua tāne papa Tom. Tāna e te e tua i iarataki mai e mātou rutu i te ia e kite pakari e te e tua no mātou 
ita na nga nga irave tsukuraya matu ke oki to matu utsu are tata kita ima te tau aru ia matu e te atsu e te mana kaka no o iru to iti atsi anga nei puri atsu ai matu pupu atsu nei matu te iru to rava ia yesu to matu atsu amen e. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.